Hello, History and Systems students. Well, we're getting to the very end of the term, and so I wanted to provide a little bit of perspective. This short video is entitled Some Perspectives Mainly Focused to Systems, and that term systems is, of course, a reference to systems in the title of our course, History and Systems. Historically, systems are also referred to as schools of psychology. That's relevant, as you'll see here in a moment. The video is mainly designed to address the, um, the topic of the alignment of psychologists historically with a system or with those schools and also to give you maybe a little bit of perspective on the, the longevity or continued influence of, of some of those systems or aspects of those systems that we've been studying this semester. Um, so first off, I, of course, want to show you my last timeline image here. Uh, and this one is, of course, highlighted with some topics in bright green over on the right there. And you can recognize these as the um, getting closer to now topics. Um, for what I'd like everybody to know for sure in the course, um, these are topics that I've picked potentially out of many modern topics in psychology. Of course, your favorite topics may not be represented here. Um, but these are some of the more influential um, 20th, 21st century um, topics in psychology that link back pretty readily to historical stuff that we've talked about. Thematic stuff, philosophical themes, and um, connect in other ways. Cognitive psychology, um, clinical psychology and related developments, uh, neuroscience, uh, physiological psychology, or biopsych, whatever you want to call that. Um, and then humanistic and positive psychology are on here also. You might take a moment to look at this uh, image up close and just study some of the details in it, at least as a chance to kind of reflect on some things that we've been doing. Uh, Darwin is listed here. There are asterisks included here for James's principles, um, Wundt's laboratory in Leipzig. Um, Watson's here, the Gestalt psychologists, um, some behaviorists like Skinner, Mary Cover Jones is there towards the lower right, um, and I've also added towards the right, closer to the line for today, um, some other people that um, you've read about or had a chance to think about perhaps, John Garcia, Barbara Skorla. Uh, Maslow and Rogers from Humanistic Psychology, Martin Seligman, who's many things, uh, including a clinician, a primary prevention um, expert, uh, and a positive psychologist, among, among other things. Uh, Leitner Whitmer is down there near the bottom. He's connected in our class mainly to uh, clinical psychology, uh, but school psychology, really. You might remember that from the reading. And there's some other people here and occurrences that might put things into uh, a, a temporal context uh, for you. The first main thing that I wanted to address in this video um, is related to this image here, and uh, you could think of these as pigeonholes. And I've labeled um, some pigeonholes with uh, terms for the systems, the seven systems that we've considered during this semester. Structuralism, functionalism, behaviorism, gestalt psychology, psychoanalysis, and humanistic psychology, and cognitive psychology. And the point I want to make about this with this image is that uh, although we've spent a lot of time and energy uh, trying to come to understand these systems or schools and what kind of define them and distinguish them one from another, that in fact it's not really the case that everybody historically in psychology aligned with or associated themselves with one of these systems or just one of these systems. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of images here from a book that Robert Sessions Woodworth 
published in 1948. We met Woodworth before. He's the one with the S-O-R uh, kind of theory where you first learned that the O between S and R referred to organismic processes, uh, which really meant mental life, so mental states and mental processes. Um, Robert Woodworth was a functionalist psychologist, essentially. At least that's how we met him. Um, that's how he's described mainly in uh, the textbook. Um, but he wrote a l about a lot of things, and this is from a book called um, Contemporary Schools of Psychology. Uh, and this is the first page of the last chapter in that book. It's called The Middle of the Road, and uh, you could read this. Uh, I want to go to the next two pages in this chapter, and this is on that pigeonholing idea. Um, if, you, if you read this, um, this part of the chapter, these two pages a little bit, after reading the, the page that I just showed you, which is the previous page to these, and you started uh, down the bottom in the left-hand column, essentially, you'd see that basically what Woodworth is saying is that if you got psychologists together in the middle of last century and you said, you know, which school or system of psychology do you associate with, that, that many people would say none. I've added the red underlining uh, over in the right column near the top, where it says a very large proportion of the entire group would remain seated. If you read all of this, you'll see how that fits here. Again, Woodworth is essentially saying that um, many, maybe most, psychologists in this time period uh, would not say, oh, I'm a behaviorist, or I'm just a behaviorist, or I'm a functionalist psychologist, or I'm just a functionalist psychologist, or um, I'm a psychoanalytic type and I'm only interested in psychoanalysis stuff. Uh, it's difficult to pigeonhole people, and this should make some sense, too, uh, for all of us, right? Because, you know, if somebody said, you know, what kind of person are you, and you on were only allowed to say one thing about yourself, you'd feel like you left a lot out about yourself. Many psychologists, historically, analogous to many people in life, um, see themselves as multidimensional. I don't know for sure, but I would submit that this same kind of thing is true today. It was perhaps true as Woodworth was describing it um, around 1950, but I think probably this is true today also. There are, uh, you know, ten times as many psychologists um, who would identify themselves as having a profession related to psychology today compared with the number that Woodworth is referencing in this book here, but I would say still the majority of them would not align themselves with a single historical school or system of psychology. Okay? So these, uh, these systems are definitely influential, but not everybody is just a staunch advocate of, of one of them, or, or maybe of any of them. Another thing that I wanted to uh, do in this video is point out some things about the time periods over which uh, first the flavors of behaviorism have had influence in psychology up to the present time and then these systems. So this image shows um, strict SR behaviorism, Tolman's operational behaviorism, Skinner's reinforcement concepts, and, and radical behaviorism. There's a timeline down at the bottom there to give you a sense of when these uh, were or are or continue to be most influential. Now this is, this is from me. There isn't really a source from this. This is kind of my sense of how things have been historically. So you see that radical behaviorism and operational behaviorism continue, continue to be influential today. There are people, you know, who align themselves with the importance of these flavors of behaviorism. Skinner's concepts of reinforcement, many of them, um, are also still highly relevant, of course, today. Uh, probably not so much um, Skinner's view that mental processes are artifacts of stimulus environments, but certainly other things about Skinner's uh, work and ideas are um, highly regarded in psychology today, um, such as, you know, the role of positive reinforcement in um, helping to determine behavior. Yeah, for sure. Strict SR, you know, I kind of think that that, in a sense, sort of ended as these other forms of behaviorism 
um, took hold, and as there were other things going on in psychology as well, as we know, right? So having studied cognitive psychology now, you can appreciate better, you know, a strict SR view, you know, largely went away, but other forms of interest in behavior and their relation to mental life um, continued. Um, certainly some of them did. I wanted to remind you about this uh, image here, which I've shown before, that um, like, it kind of shows uh, different um, blocks of um, topics as we've worked through the semester. And we've, in fact, worked through pretty much all of this now. Um, but if you take a lot of what's here, the systems that are shown here in particular, and, and not just systems are shown here, but if you take those and you make an analogous kind of uh, time period visual, you might get something like this. This is also uh, mine. Uh, these are my thoughts about this. So if you tried to show the beginning time, roughly, and continued influence of these different systems in history and systems, it might look something like this. Uh, where you see modern cognitive psychology, and, and emphasis on modern there, right? Modern cognitive psychology probably got started around the 1960s. Were there roots of cognitive psychology before that? Sure. Uh, and I have a previous video that addresses that. There's humanism there starting around the 1950s, Gestalt psychology around 1910 with Wertheimer when he got off the train at Frankfurt and bought a stroboscope you know, roughly around then, and then, you know, this really interesting period of time. You can see this maybe better now, perhaps, than ever before. Gestalt psychology, psychoanalysis, um, behaviorism, uh, functionalism, all getting started uh, around 1900, certainly in the early 1900s. I have structuralism down there at the bottom, um, getting started, of course, before 1900, uh, with Wundt and Titchener in Germany, with Titchener in, in America, and then I have question marks there, meaning, you know, when did structuralism end in its influence? Uh, I'm not sure it ever did. Um, it's difficult to find scholars weighing in on that. I think that, in a sense, structuralism, that term, the word structuralism, um, just isn't really used anymore. Uh, in psychology in, in a useful way. Nobody goes around saying, that I know of, goes around saying, I'm a structuralist psychologist and I'm only a structuralist psychologist. I think, however, uh, some of the basic goals of structuralism or of structuralist psychologists from, you know, 1880 through to the, at least the early 1900s, as shown here, I think some of the goals and interests of structuralist psychologists um, end up being adopted in, in these other schools, or certainly just by other people, whether they are aligned or affiliated with a school or a system at all in psychology. And by this I mean, um, you know, remember one of the um, interests of structuralist psychologists was essentially to figure out what is in the mind, right? To catalog what are parts of our mental life. A biologist might do something analogous if they discovered a new form of life and they initially asked relatively simple questions, relatively, right? Uh, simple questions like, what are the parts of this new organism? In psychology, as we make um, new discoveries, we say, oh, what is this theory of mind? Is that a real thing? Like, what's in it? What uh, what are the pieces that are operating when we try to study theory of mind in young people? All right, so maybe it's cognitive psychologists and psychodynamic uh, uh, types and, and operational behaviorists and, and maybe others who continue to have interest in questions um, like that in psychology. What are the basic elements that make up mental states and, and mental processes? Again, maybe not as exciting as some other things in psychology are to many of us, but perhaps some of the spirit of structuralism does live on. Um, that's a, a less important point, I think, um, shown by this visual here. To me, it's much more important to kind of appreciate, hey, you know, psychology continues um, to be made up in part, remember the pigeonhole stuff from just a few minutes ago, psychology continues to be made up, at least in part, of people with uh, interests that have their roots in these various systems. And I think that helps to, an, again, just to an extent, but to an extent, to uh, un help us understand 
um, why is psychology the way that it is today? These systems continue to live on in certain ways, and we can understand psychology better, and the people who make up psychology, people uh, like you and me and, and others that we know at Denison and across the planet interested in psychology, we can know them better by knowing something about you know, how do they align themselves with a school or a system? What do they think is important about the subject matter and the methods and goals of psychology? And that's what I've got for today. Thanks very much. Take care, everybody.